Hi, I'm Claudine and welcome to Rabo TV, sharing the latest future thinking in ag tech. Today I'm joined by Ben to tell us what's happening in global markets and Tim to talk about China. And it seems you can teach an old cow new tricks, thanks to the development of virtual fencing. Today we're joined by McKeel, Director of Agriculture and Food at CSIRO and driver of this technology which has been designed for more effective herd and soil management. Welcome McKeel, thanks for joining us today. So how does the technology behind the virtual fence work? Well, a, a virtual fence is, a, is, is something that is, uh, is designed by, by the GPS signal, so the GPS location. So the animals have a collar and that collar is powered by solar. It is connected to the GPS and you on your iPad, you can set a boundary of your, um, of your, of your paddock and um, and then the animals are contained with that because when they move to the f to the fence, the virtual fence, they get an audio signal, and then um, uh, if they then pass the fence, they get a, a a little shock, and that teaches them to stay within the paddock based on the audio fence. So does this make livestock handling easier? Yes, exactly. You know, you could sit down in your lounge chair on your you know on your on your veranda there, and you can uh, sort of draw the lines of where you want your, your cattle to go and herd them to a, a new piece of pasture or keep them out of the, uh, you know, out of the environmentally sensitive area. So there are lots of opportunities to maximize your, 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 your grazing efficiency and also improve the sustainability of the, uh, of the herd that you have on your land. So how long does it take for the cattle to learn where the boundaries are? Well, I would think a little bit, it's like, uh, you know, if you have your parking sensor and you go to the parking lot with a new car, you sort of get, it goes beep, 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 you know, and then sort of, if you, if you go a little bit too far, you hit the car on the other side. It's not a, it's not a big deal, but um, this is how this works, no? So it's about two and a half times on average that, a, that, um, that an animal uh, passes the fence and gets an electric shock. And then they know from the audio signal, oh, I should not go there, like on your parking sensor, really. And, um, and then they follow that only by the audio cue. So what are the benefits of these virtual fences for farmers? So if, if you think, of course, fencing is a big investment for farmers, no? It is a lot of work to put them in and you would, ideally have smaller paddocks where you can move uh, the, the, your herd uh, you know, through and your cattle through, and that, that will then optimize the use of your land. But because of that cost, we, you know, that, that doesn't happen. And, and you have to get this, this trade-off between the work of putting in and moving the cattle around and the cost of the fence. Here, that all goes away because you can do that yourself and you can set these paddocks much smaller. So your grazing efficiency goes up a lot. You avoid overgrazing and it becomes much more sustainable. So you're trialling virtual fencing in New South Wales. When do you think it'll be available elsewhere? Yeah, we work with um, AgriSense, a company that is building, uh, you know, uh, that is commercialising this. Uh, you know, the, 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 the technology was invented and, 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 uh, and primarily developed in, in CSIRO. And then, of course, we have a commercialisation development partner who is rolling that out uh, globally. They are planning to go to market in 2022. And so there's now beta testing going on, not only in New South Wales, but actually internationally as well. So uh, we are hoping this is going to take the, you know, uh, the livestock industry by storm. In regards to cost, uh, what are the benefits of virtual versus traditional fencing? The cost benefit analysis estimates that the profitability increased in the dairy industry by about $350 per year per cow and uh, in the beef industry by about two and a half percent, both from improved uh, grazing management um, in, in, in both this dairy and the beef industry. Congratulations, McKeel. I'm sure a lot of producers will be looking on with great interest. Yeah, thank you, Claudine. And of course, this is not the only thing that we do at Sarah. We, it is, we are just brimming of these type of innovations. And thank you for the time. It's incredible technology, isn't it, Ben? It's pretty incredible, Claudine, to think that we might be driving through the country soon and there'd be no fences. Could be a game changer. What's happening this week in markets? Well, last week, Wes gave us an update on fertiliser prices, so I thought it might be good to look at another input cost that should be top of mind for Australian agribusiness. Crude oil prices have been quietly staging a remarkable rally since April last year. Viewers who keep a close eye on the financial markets might remember that at the start of the pandemic back in April, crude oil prices actually fell by so much that oil traders started paying buyers to take their product. 
Basically, as global airlines were grounded overnight and consumers working from home were no longer filling up the petrol tank quite so often, the world experienced a huge crude oil supply glut. The oversupply was so bad that not enough infrastructure existed to store it all. And that's why traders were briefly paying people to take the oil. If we fast forward to today, the move has reversed and crude oil prices are at their highest level since the middle of 2019. As national lockdowns have been relaxed and workers returned to the office, there has been an increase in demand for transport fuels. At the same time, production capacity that was dramatically scaled back last year has failed to keep up with the renewed demand, hence the increasing price level. There are some theories in the market that energy companies have underinvested in new supply exploration, and that implies that the increase in prices may have further to go yet. Stronger prices for crude oil, along with iron ore and copper, has helped the Australian dollar to recover some ground over the last week. The Aussie had traded as low as 76.26, but has rebounded to be more than one US cent stronger. The strength of the currency is reflective of the relative strength of the Australian economy. The Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development upgraded their forecast for 2021 Australian economic growth to 4.5% last week. This is up from the 3.2% that they had forecast back in December. Australian stocks have also had a decent start to the year, with the ASX 200 index up by more than 2.7%. Big mining companies have been the major beneficiaries of higher bulk commodity prices, and the banks have seen gains as a result of higher bond yields. And that's finance. Thanks, Ben. It's a good time to fill up before prices rise. And now we cross to Tim to explore whether China is still buying food and agri-products from Australia. Thanks, Claudine. The last 18 months have seen escalating political tensions on a range of fronts between Australia and China, its largest trading partner. China warned Australia that eventually trade would suffer if relations didn't improve. And from mid-2020, China began erecting a series of formal barriers to Australian product, such as heavy tariffs on barley and wine, and informal barriers such as prolonging inspection times for seafood that makes trade impractical. Shipments of these targeted products have suffered badly. In the month of January, Australian fishermen would usually ship over $100 million worth of crustaceans, including lobsters, to China. This year, that was less than $10 million. Australian winemakers would usually ship $40 to $80 million worth of product to China in January. This year, total alcoholic beverage shipments slowed to a trickle. And the barley trade, worth about $100 million a month, ceased completely. But China has so far continued to buy other food and ag products from Australia. Large volumes of meat, wool and dairy continue to flow between the two countries. And December saw a record shipment of wheat to China from Australian shores. So, For now, China appears willing to stop taking discretionary goods from Australia, but is still buying products that are essential or at least very inconvenient to do without. All up, Australian food and ag exports to China are down from the peaks we saw in 2019. Average shipments in the last three months have fallen to around $700 million, their lowest level in four years. Not all of this is due to political tensions, but they're certainly playing a role. For those industries which have recently lost access to China, a key question has been how quickly they can pivot to find new markets for product elsewhere. Barley exporters have been able to do this pretty well. Product has been redirected from China to Thailand and Saudi Arabia, amongst other markets. And with more volume and rising world prices, the value of exports leaving Australia are actually up on last January. It's proved harder for wine exporters to switch so quickly. The global wine market is not as tight as that for barley and the product's far less commoditized. Exports of all alcoholic beverages actually fell in January compared with the prior year, with exporters just not able to switch product into new markets quick enough. In terms of the lobster industry and crustacean exporters more generally, they found it hardest to replace China. 
up to 95% of product is typically destined for that market in the past and considerable premiums are paid in China versus other markets. Australian exporters will need to continue to develop markets outside of China to hedge their risks in coming years. With commodity markets generally tied at present, the world economy in recovery phase and favourable seasonal conditions at home, thankfully now is a pretty good time to be doing just that. So back to you, Claudine. It's great that Australia has a strong brand and reputation for quality on our side. I think that's right, Claudine. Hopefully it's just a matter of time before consumers from the US to Japan realise how lucky they are to have better access to Australian wine, meat and seafood. Now China's buying less. Thanks, Tim. And thanks for joining us for another episode of Rabo TV. That's all we have time for today. But tune in next week as we speak with an innovative northern New South Wales grain grower who has taken organisational challenges into his own hands, literally, through an all-in-one management app. Follow us on social media for all the updates and we look forward to seeing you then.